provides help, talent or so. Okay. Good morning, good morning, uh, and welcome to the debate on management experiences and implications uh, of the what the World Economic Forum calls uh, Great Recession. If I may start with a technical issue, one of our panelists prefers to speak Chinese. So those who are not so fluent in Chinese, please make sure that you find on your seat um, the instruments which will help you to get this in English. Let me just start this session with some observation of what we hear, what we read uh, during these times, that economists have uh, uh, involved themselves in very serious debates about what is normally labeled the future of capitalism. And that applies to practicing uh, economists uh, as well as to economists from the academic side. There is the issue of regulation, the relationship between business and uh, governments. And um, in the theoretical field, there is a major question raised whether what we call the efficient market hypothesis is still valid, whether in economics irrational behavior should not have a much larger room as this is increasingly becoming uh, important. My impression is that much less of that debate is taking place in the business world. At least it is not carried out into the press. And academics, and I'm one of those, have been rather discreet or quiet about the implications of the Great uh, Recession. Now, there may be good reasons for that. Um, businesses in different countries have been very differently uh, impacted. Uh, different industries have had very different results. And even, interestingly enough, in given industries, uh, companies have been affected in a very different way. So we have heard all these horror stories of closures, of layoffs, of uh, running out of cash. We've heard uh, Jack Welch all of a sudden denying that he uh, proposed uh, shareholder value maximization. Um, but that's about it. Now, we have a um, panel of true business leaders here in front of us, and uh, we will ask them what the impact of the great crisis has been for them, their company, uh, and uh, what lessons they have learned during these last uh, 12 or 24 months. And then in the second uh, half of this session, I would like to move from the reports on what has happened uh, to a second, perhaps more interesting uh, question Will management in future be different, or was what we have just seen, and perhaps will continue to see over the next months, just be one of these crises which we have to overcome, and then we will be in more quiet waters again before we hit the next crisis? Among the four panelists, we have one person from the manufacturing plus service side, and four representatives of the service industry. Let me start introducing um, our national representative here, Mr. Soon Hong, who is chairman of the Dalian Port and related companies. Uh, it's a company which is listed in Hong Kong. He is also representative to the 11th National People Congress. And um, without asking him beforehand, I said, you will have been impacted because when export and imports go down, your business is going down as well. So he will definitely have been affected. 
Secondly, we have uh, Ben Verfarian here on stage, and I mentioned these two first because they're not in your program. I've jumped in at the very last minute, thanks very much. Uh, ben was with Lucent beforehand, then, and many of you will be aware of that, became the CEO of British Telecom from 2003 and two th to 2008, so fairly recently, and went through some very serious restructuring there. And um, if that's not enough, uh, has one year ago taken over the leadership in Alcatel Lucent, a difficult company to lead anyhow, and now in difficult times, most probably even more difficult to lead. He is also one of the mentors of this event here in Dalian. And then, if I may say so, we have two old-timers here who are also described uh, in the program. Uh, Mr. Morris Levy, uh, Levy uh, one of the founder members of the World Economic Forum, who is the chairman and CEO of Publicis. And what I find remarkable when I look at his CV, he has been with the company almost 40 years, 40 years. He joined the company when it was a very small advertising uh, agency and has made it into one of the very large giants in the industry with more than 50,000 uh, employees. And obviously, in advertising, you're dealing with discretionary expenses from the company's point of view. And uh, we're looking forward to hear from him what that meant for an advertising agency. And last but not least, um, again, a mentor of the event, and again, somebody we've seen on stage already at many other forums beforehand, James Shiro from the Zurich Group. Um, Jim, we appreciate that you are here because I looked at the list of participants. Not many people from the financial industry are represented. Um, and I wonder whether they are hiding or whether they don't want to talk about this. Uh, you definitely uh, have gone through difficult times, I guess, uh, because the Great Recession was initially, at least, also called the Great Financial Meltdown. So let's start um, with the first question. What has been the impact on your firm, on yourself? What actions have you taken? Or let me just rephrase this. From today's point of view, what would you have done knowing that the crisis was coming differently 12 or 18 months ago? Morris, perhaps I can start with you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we, we are a, an advertising and marketing service company. We operate in 104 countries uh, and uh, we have uh, 45,000 people more than 40% uh, of our revenues are coming from the US. The two key uh, issues that we have to face in our industry is that uh, the first one is uh, the fact that we have more than 60% of our revenues which are devoted to personal cost. So our people are eating 60% and plus of our revenues, roughly 62, 63, 64%. The second thing is that we have a, a relationship with our clients, which are fairly simple. With one single phone call, they can cancel a campaign, they can cancel orders, <laughs> and they can say, um, sorry, but the issues are such that we have to uh, make tough decisions and we are postponing our campaign or we are simply uh, cancelling it. So how have we faced the situation considering that um, last year we had a record year despite the crisis and that this <coughs> year we are posting the best number of our industry. <coughs> the first thing is that as soon as we have seen the first sign of the crisis, which is in July 2007, we decided that uh, we, we will have a 
a, a crisis which will be much tougher than we believed and that everyone believed in those days. And if you remember, in 2007, July, uh, there was a lot of people who were saying, yes, we are taking a small hit and things are just finished. And we have seen how things have been deteriorating uh, during uh, all these months. So we anticipated, and that is a key word, and we took a few decisions which have been very difficult to put in place, and particularly the fact that we decided that we are not going to fire our people, that we are not going to blindly cut our structure, but we will, with subtlety, keep as much people as we could and avoid replacing the levers or replacing one uh, le one, one, two levers by one person. So we took this decision uh, during the summer 2007. The second thing that we did is to look at the drivers of growth and to see what we had to do in order to take maximum advantage of these drivers of growth. And we decided to invest. And we have invested heavily in difficult times where everyone was deciding to uh, go to the trenches and to uh, cover itself, we decided that we will invest in uh, acquiring key agencies that we uh, needed badly in order to be in a segment which we are growing and to increase our position in digital. And the second thing is to increase our position in emerging market where there was still some growth. So this has been roughly the key decision. And um, if we look at uh, the end of the day, what happened is that um, we have been able to uh, keep our people highly motivated. We have one motto, which is difficult to translate in English, uh, which is nous croyons en l'homme, which means roughly we believe in human spirit, and uh, the fact that we were not taking tough actions against our people has kept our people very motivated. And when most of our competitors were uh, dealing with restructuring, we were dealing with uh, going out for new business and for growth. The second thing is that obviously, we took a number of nitty-gritty small decisions, but which at the end of the day has saved uh, millions, tens of millions of euros of uh, cost, simply because we have explained to our people that every penny that we will save on GNA, general expenses, are monies that we will not have to save from personal cost. The third aspect is that we have intensive program of training during all this period of time and motivation program in order that everyone spend more time listening to the need of our client rather than spending time inside the agency and trying to save their future. So, it was relatively simple because we have uh, had the belief very early on that the recession will be tough, that it will be very difficult, that we will face a lot of problems and that our clients will need us and that we had to focus on their needs. And this is what we have done roughly. Thanks very much, uh, Maurice. Mr. Soon, uh, shipping, shipbuilding, logistics, port management, these were the most interesting businesses of the last years. Mm -hmm. Then the Great Recession came. How did you handle that? Uh, I think that the interpreter the English level are much better than me, so let us enjoy their service. Yes. So I was speaking Chinese, sorry. 
The port industry has also been greatly affected by this recession because China's uh, dependence on exports is up to 70 percent. So the development of China's ports have been based on the rapid development of uh, China's export economy. We have actually been saying the wolf is coming, the wolf is coming for a long time, but when it finally came, it was still a little bit unexpected. Over the last 30 years, we've been developing and growing at the rate of 20 percent, and suddenly we dropped to minus 20 percent, a drop of minus 20 percent. So this has actually affected us greatly. And I think we've all seen what has happened in other sectors. So in the course of this recession, one of the main challenges we're facing in the harbor and port industry is, one, the uh, development of ports is a very long cycle. And so you can imagine that a lot of shipping industries, a lot of building industries have entered the development of ports, and all of them have tried to and wanted to benefit from this 20 percent growth. And there's often a five-year lag from the investment in the facilities to the final completion. So before the recession hit, we realized that we would probably have to control the um, growth of our uh, investment, particularly in the container area. The second is clients. A lot of your business comes from shipping companies and other clients. So whether it's shipping clients or exporters, they are very much concerned about costs now in the recession. So many companies have uh, tried to cut their costs and cut their prices and to decrease their percentage. But in even at the height in a port, for, for ports, it's really quite difficult to maintain. So we've had to try and maintain and increase our services to our largest clients. So we provide full services for them, not only in the ports, but also logistics support. We now have our own fleet. So when it comes to uh, shipping transport and uh, internal domestic uh, within the country, we can also provide full services. Connected with this, for instance, the railways, we are working with the railways in order to increase our value added services. We're also trying to control costs, and we work very hard in this. The port of Dalian is a state-owned enterprise, and it's very difficult for us to decrease employees or cut employees. Also, to train someone uh, to work well in the port, we need, it takes five years. So uh, we have committed to our employers that, employees that we will not cut their pay or decrease any of their benefits. So that means we're going to have to work very hard at decreasing costs in other areas. Last point is, this is a capital-intensive area, and 30 percent of our costs are in our human capacity. And then uh, another percentage, the final 30 percent is in our actual shipping. So it's very hard for us to develop if we don't guarantee, we cannot guarantee our liquidity and our cash flow. We issued bonds last year to the tune of 500 million so that we haven't been able to maintain our growth. Also, we realize that we have a lot of opportunities in the course of this recession. The central government has raise the strategy of trying to guarantee our demand and also con guarantee our development. So at the same time as exports have greatly dropped, we have also anticipated that China's 
development is still going to extend over a long period of time. If we want to guarantee an 8% growth, then the government's inputs have to be quite large. And that means that there need to be imports of mineral ores and other primary products. So we have increased our investment in all facilities to deal with this kind of uh, imports. This year, in the imports of uh, minerals, we have not only increased our market share, our services have also extended to the Bay of Bohai and other, um, other ports. So apart from uh, serving our clients in the northeast of, Thai, uh, of China itself, we are also serving clients in other parts of China. As the prices have fluctuated and the length of negotiations for prices have dragged out without any specific uh, decision, so it, this kind of trade has become extremely uncertain. So we've had to extend our storage capacities in the port. Transfer uh, business has also increased. And so starting from January this year, our whole uh, we've had a great drop in uh, imports and exports. But in August, thanks to the uh, policies of the government and our own efforts, uh, we have actually managed to maintain 12 percent growth. So this is our general background, which means that we're actually quite lucky in our situation. I think we need to take certain defensive measures so that we can survive the winter and then also be prepared for the spring of economic development. Thank you. So in both cases, we have heard that you mentioned lucky. You were lucky or very capable. Ben, can I call on you? Uh, you are in your new company only for 12 months. You came in most probably at the most impossible time. Do you regret that, to have joined them at that moment? I think that um, I was lucky enough to um, get four for the price of one. I mean, I mean four crises for the price of one, uh, which is always good if you get four to one. But um, first of all, let me say that your question is about what we did managerial. Mm. Um, I don't think that we, have to re we had to react, certainly not in my case, simply to a financial crisis. I think we have two other parts of the crisis as well. We have a, a crisis of confidence in the institutions. And we have a crisis that is lingering already for a long time and that will come to the surface as well, and it has to do with climate change and that will have an impact on what consumers and our customers will require from us. And in addition to that, we had our own crisis, which was basically made of a, uh, a not fully consumed merger. Now, that was the easy part. Um, I would like to bring it down to basically three words. The first word is confidence. The confidence of your customers, the confidence of your shareholders, and the confidence of your employees. The second word, equally important, is that of innovation. Because I believe standing still, which is the, the temptation to do, stop all the new stuff, let's concentrate on what we have, certainly in our industry, is a kiss of death. And the third element is an increased need for transparency. Now, these, are, these things are all counterintuitive. In a time of crisis, and, the, and you started by saying that, where was management? Well, management is trying to hide because they were very busy trying to repair and hose the water out of the ship. But you are right, that knee-jerk reaction is maybe not the best reaction. So the first thing I think you need to do, and we needed to do, is rebuild confidence from our customer base, from our employees, and from our shareholders. And the only way I know to do that is to be extraordinarily transparent in this is what we're going to do. This is the time frame in which we're going to do it. And you please follow us. And that means that I think you, be, you go out and you make yourself pretty vulnerable by being totally transparent in the actions you're going to take. 
and give a time frame to it in which you're going to take them. I was not as lucky as Maurice was in having the ability to deal with the issue without looking to restructuring. We had to do restructuring. But we have to do it in a way that is understood and accepted, not just by our employees, but also by customers and shareholders. The second thing is innovation. I think in a time of crisis, the choice you have to make is whether you continue to invest in that what builds tomorrow, or you hold back. And in our industry, where we deal with an increased speed of the time that it takes between innovation and monetization, where it becomes shorter and shorter, we have taken the decision to increase our spend in innovation, which means cutting harder in the part that is best described as comfort. So by cutting harder in comfort, making money available for innovation, and at the same time restore the financial order, you need to make some very tough choices. And you need to do it, in my view, in direct dialogue with your customers and your shareholders. And therefore, the most important part of the lesson, management lesson of this crisis has been transparency. I think the comfort zone for management has been reduced greatly. And for some industry, it means that you have to redefine. And for other industries, it means that you have to reallocate. But for every industry, it means you have to make sure that the transparency in what you do based on what criteria is going up. And that means that if we're going to talk later on on what the lessons are going forward, it is very uncomfortable talking. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, we have now had the second, third time the word luck been mentioned. Uh, Jim, have you just been lucky? Because you're still here. Well, I, uh, I learned a long time ago, uh, you know, if you visit Las Vegas or Macau, uh, you have to have some degree of luck, but I wouldn't go in there based on uh, running my business hoping for luck. Uh, I think that uh, when I look at Zurich uh, and why we're here, uh, we experienced and were preparing, just like uh, athlete, athletes preparing for the Olympics, uh, for this crisis starting in 2002, 2003. When I arrived at Zurich in 2002, we were in the midst of one of the most uh, difficult for us as a company of uh, financial crises. And we had to step back and look at many of the restructuring provisions that Ben talked about. Uh, and in fact, uh, this process of communication uh, and talking to your customers and reassuring your customers, I learned then because that's when I first met Ben. Uh, I went to visit him as one of our largest customers at BT, uh, there to reassure him that Zurich would be there. Uh, he was a welcome sight because he was going through a similar restructuring at BT, so we understood the problems together very well. But in the financial services industry, uh, you have one thing that is very, very critical, uh, and that is your credibility in the marketplace. Uh, and trust and credibility are things that you really cherish and are very difficult to restore. And I think that's one of the challenges that the financial services industry is presented with today. And that basically manifests itself in the strength of your balance sheet. Because at the end of the day, everyone's looking at the strength of your balance sheet, whether you're a bank or an insurance company in our case, are you going to be there? capable of replaying claims uh, when the promise you made comes due. Uh, and one of the key issues for us is w in 2002, 2003 that I saw is that we had a non-integrated risk management system. Uh, we didn't understand at that period of time where our risks were. We didn't understand during that period of time in 2002, 2003, were we adequately balancing the investments we were making 
against the risks or liabilities we were taking on. So when the crisis started to hit, and we saw this crisis beginning, uh, and it wasn't that we had wisdom and foresight, uh, we saw it in the fall of 2007 when some of the larger players in our industry, particularly those that had invested heavily in the financial products industry, started reporting losses. We immediately shifted to understanding where our risks were. We called upon our global risk network. Uh, they reported to me weekly uh, what the major risks were, uh, what were the mitigating circumstances and actions that we could take in anticipation of those risks. Because at the end of the day, the ultimate thing we had to protect was our balance sheet. So as things began to unfold, and we were in the planning process last summer, not unlike what Maurice said, uh, we started putting in actions to reduce costs. Uh, reduce costs by, again, we are very highly people concentrated, not replacing people. Uh, we also saw this as a time when we were looking around the rest of the industry for us as a period of enormous opportunity. We had a goal and aspiration to be a top five global insurer by market cap. Uh, we were probably somewhere around number nine or eight, and we saw this as others would suffer dislocation. We can attract people, which we have. We've been hiring talented people during this, talented people and opening up new businesses and new prospects. Uh, we are focused on growing our revenues. Yes, as insurable assets decline, our top line has shrunk or remained flat, but in the parts of the market where we want to grow, we are making our investments and committing our capital in those sections. And at the same time, uh, hard to believe, we have been raising prices. Because for us, we have to ensure that the fundamentals of our business are right, that we're adequately pricing the risk that we're taking on or passing it off. So we have had 26 consecutive quarters of profitability. And since the manifestation of the crisis uh, with the Lehman failure, we've had three consecutive quarters of increasing profitability. We don't look at this as luck. We look at this as it's part of our job, and it's what we trained ourselves to do. And the last piece is transparency communication. You know, uncertainty is probably the greatest evil in any situation. And the idea is to remove that uncertainty as rapidly as you can. And we took out to, again, talking to customers, reminding them of our strength in solvency, but very, very importantly, talking to our people. We went out on road shows. Uh, we realized we couldn't talk to that many people. Uh, we have 60,000 people all over the world. I, uh, in Davos, really experienced for the first time YouTube. Uh, I put something on YouTube almost every other week to all of our people, uh, very surprising. Uh, sometimes to my children that they see me on YouTube. Uh, I get a lot of coaching from my colleagues, uh, but it is a tremendous communication skill uh, tool to use. But the idea is to get the message out, let your people know that you're in front managing the situation and that you're managing expectations of them, the customers, and the shareholders uh, through this crisis. So for us, as I step back, we continue to see this as a period of opportunity, uh, a period in which we will protect our balance sheet and at the same time seize upon opportunities like the acquisition we made in the midst of the crisis of 21st century, which was the personal lines business of AIG in North America. That was an enormous signal to all of our people in the market that we had this capital strength to be executing in that period of time. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, several of you said that they had expended, used this time to expand their business, which just underlines this sort of the Chinese uh, word of risk, which has two elements, cri uh, crisis and opportunity. 
Now, several times we also mentioned transparency towards customers, towards shareholders, but in particular towards the employees. Now that employees are the most important asset of a company, we've heard that for many years. Is that now taken much more seriously in future, would you say? Is the C-suite, the CEOs, the CFOs, etc., are they, will they be in future less detached from the workforce and from others? Ben, perhaps I can uh, come back to you. You mentioned that. So um, <clears throat> we're now going into, I think, the discussion about the broader context going forward. Yep. And I would like to start with a word that today people like to avoid at any price, and that's the word risk. The knee-jerk reaction of this crisis is that people think that you can combine risk-free and innovation and entrepreneurial spirit. And I think that's impossible. We have to re-evaluate the word risk. Risk, as long as you understand the risk, is a necessary, integral part of doing business. We are in the business of transforming the way people communicate. We have to react to 20-year-olds, how they use new communication tools. But to translate that into products and services and capabilities is a risk. But we need to understand the risk and take the right decisions based on our closeness to our customers, our understanding of our own employees, and our own gut feel as leaders to make the right decisions. But if we try to get out of this crisis with a risk minimization attitude, and saying to our boards and to our customers, we will eliminate risks, you will eliminate growth. So I want to bring up the issue here that yes, the, the conditions under which you take risks have to be totally transparent, including what type of capabilities do you have in-house and what type of capabilities you need to find in other companies that you need to work with. And therefore, basically, you will have a new level of leadership, a new definition of leadership needed in dealing with risk in the after-crisis period. And I think we need that debate, and we need that debate very quickly. Otherwise, you get defensive behavior as a kind of role model going forward. We can't have that. Right, so the CEO in the role of the corporate risk manager? Well, the risk manager is those who will raise their finger and say, please don't do that. That is the, the classical definition of a risk manager. I would say, of a responsible risk taker. And a responsible risk taker is somebody who's informed, understand the tools that she or he has, and understand the environment in which you need to operate. Classic for that, number one requirement is absolute transparency with your board, absolute transparency with your key people in order to take those risks. But at the end of the day, it's also the personal responsibility of some of these say, I hear you, but we go anyway. Right. That will make, as you said yourself, the role of the CEO much more uncomfortable. Absolutely. Morris, how would, do you see that? Would this make the job, which you have, for example, less attractive? And secondly, I would just like to add this. How about the implications of risk, risk sharing? both profits and losses. Will this be differently distributed in future than it has been in the past? Do you see anything changing there? Uh, there is a lot of implication, but before answering the question, if you allow me to do that, I, I would like to stress one aspect, which I think is something that has been probably underestimated in these last years, and which has been touched upon both by Ben and Jim, which is the role of communication and the role of the media. Uh, today, we are in a world which is transparent. Everything that a company does will be known. Every wrongdoing will be known. Every good thing will be known. And the idea to hide behind, uh, I don't know which uh, 
kind of uh, 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 fence is something which will not work. And the exposure of the CEO, of the company leader, is something that we cannot avoid. So we have to take that into account and we have to make it part of the policy and the management of every company. We need to communicate in a transparent way. We need to speak to our people. We need to speak to our consumer customers and we need to speak to the shareholders and we need to take into account uh, the feeling of um, the public opinion. So this has be, having been said, there is some major issues. Uh, ben has mentioned risk-taking. I fully agree. I think that um, the worst thing which can happen in a, a situation like this one is to stay still. Uh, it's only last month that we have announced the acquisition of um, a very large company we were fighting against a lot of competitors and uh, we, we decided to put the best offer on the table because we believe that uh, this would change and transform our company. And we need to transform ourselves. We have no choice. We have to keep up with the momentum of the change of uh, the youngsters and the next population. And if you don't do innovation, if you don't take <coughs> risk, the only thing which can happen to your companies is to slow down and maybe to downgrade progressively. <clears throat> Regarding now the boards, if I look at uh, many boards I know well and many CEOs I'm working with and I'm seeing uh, the evolution in many companies in, uh, in the US, in Europe, in Asia, in Latin America, what do we see? Boards are risk adverse, most of the time. And boards prefer to wait. But boards can be convinced, and boards are today much more involved in the process of decision, and they want to know. So if you do your job, which is to involve your board early on, and to explain your strategy, and to explain what you are going to do, and you don't surprise the board, then you have the support of the board. And there is a clear change. The idea that the CEO was uh, a king, a dictator, uh, God, is finished. This is an idea which belonged to the past. I, it, it has never been my personal idea but I'm not really a, a, a very important CEO, I'm just a small one in, in, in the small country, France. But <laughs> if, if you look at um, the large company, very often, simply because of a process and simply because of, uh, of the way people are looking at you and the waiting from you a lot of decision, you believe that you are really God. And I think that is the biggest mistake which can happen to CEOs, they are just human beings, they have to take into account the idea of the other, and at the point in time, they have to make a decision. Right, wrong, but they have to make a decision. And the best way to make this decision is to enter into a process of transparency. I fully agree with you, Ben, fully agree with you, Jim. I think there is no other way to work transparency and involving maximum people, and at the end of the day, somebody has to make a decision and that's the risk that the CEO has to take. Thanks very much, Maurice. Um, so the king is dead, the CEO is dead, as we <laughs> knew that beforehand. Mr. Soon, is this a Western idea? Or has this anything to do with China? Um, what we understand, um, and I have to be careful what I'm saying, Chinese companies are not necessarily very transparent not only from the outside perspective, but also inside, you have most probably also a greater gap between those at the top and those at the bottom of the hierarchy. You have government influence. Is that something which rings a bell? More transparency? Did you, do you see this coming for you as well? Or is this just a wild Western idea? 
I think that the, the Chinese company and the Western company are quite a little bit different from history, from long term view. That uh, I think we, we have too much uh, transparency in the corporation. Uh, we have a union, a union very strongly drawing the part of the, 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 the board, you know, part of the board member. They draw in everything, every decision making process. We have the party in a state owned enterprise. We have the party organization. The party secretary also drawing the decision making. Of course, we have the shareholder, normally the state owned enterprise. All this organization drawing the decision making. But I think that the transparency, so, so in, in normally in, in, a, in a state owned enterprise, you cannot say that the CEO is the, is the king. We are not, we are the king. We are, we are the, uh, we are the part of an employee. Mm -hmm. But I think that what we learn as Chinese enterprise from this crisis that uh, I fully agree with uh, the two speakers. That the first one, the confidence is very important. The risk means uh, danger or opportunity. You, you have to make the choice. When you make the choice, you, some people have given you enough information. You have to let right people to do the right thing. So the internal communication, share of the information is very, very important. Not only in the managing segment, but also in your employee. So in my organization, we have a quarterly uh, direct dialogue with the, uh, with the labor from very, very, very uh, bottom level, uh, junior staff, looking looking for what they are thinking. Right, so how, how would you see a Chinese company evolving over the next years? In which direction? I think we, think, uh, I think we go the same direction because, because uh, we, we face the same kind of uh, global economic environment, uh, same kind of uh, regulation, more or less. So we will go the same direction. But uh, we, when we set up, we, we have the board member, we have a management, uh, a management team, uh, but transparency is very, very, very mm -hmm. important. And another thing is, you know, uh, 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 innovation in the, in the, in the company. Mm -hmm. okay. if, you, if you do that, it's not so easy. You, if you can do the innovation in the organization structure, you have to change some people you have to change the structure internally. So that all the communication and the transparency are also very important. Mm -hmm. I Thanks. think the universal question. Jim, risk management is something which we learn from the financial industry. So is that something new to you, or is this something just as a continuation of what you have always done? Or where do you see a major change in your industry? I think, uh, you know, that, that's what I mentioned earlier about uh, how we reacted to this crisis. Uh, and the most important thing, and I think the failing uh, that's flowed over here, is you have to understand the risk. Uh, and I think Ben pointed that out uh, in his comments uh, as well. You know, the tendency at times like this are for everyone to retreat and become extremely risk adverse. Uh, that is a danger, uh, I believe, because you cannot emerge from this crisis by being risk adverse. I think the real part and the role that uh, companies like Zurich play on the insurance side is helping people to understand the risk and provide the options, in our case from an insurable standpoint, uh, to mitigate some of the risk. I think what, what happened to a great extent, and you hear this term particularly among the politicians about systemic risk. Uh, I think it's a new term, 
Uh, I'm not sure a lot of people really understand when they use this term what it actually means. Uh, uh, you know, what you see in a lot of uh, political environments today, uh, they want to appoint someone who will be the systemic risk regulator or the systemic risk leader. Uh, I think if I were offered that job, I'd want a job description first. <laughs> but, but I think it, it is truly important, uh, and I joke about that uh, on the one hand, but when you look at risk, whether you're in a manufacturing company or in a services business or in our business, you have to understand what the risks are, but you have to ask yourself, what are the unintended consequences of the risk I'm about to take? And then, what's the risk reward ratio on the returns? And I think that we have got to come back to uh, this transparency and make sure that the boards are educated in this regard to understand it, that the investors and stakeholders are understanding what this is and what the risks are and the returns are. I think that's critically important if we're going to emerge from this great recession as we talk about it. And, and if I could take one last piece, because I think it impacts my industry more than the others but perhaps uh, Ben's as well, we do need regulatory reform. Okay. Uh, we have a regulatory system that emerged after the late Great Depression. When you look at the transparency and technology that we embrace today, the regulatory framework is not keeping pace with the risks that people are taking and the speed at which they're taking risks. So there has to be a step back, and business has to embrace that risk. Uh, and I have a fear, as we start to see some recovery here, we will back away from that because there will be lobbying on the part of businesses to say, we don't need it, let's move on. And I think from a political standpoint, it will be difficult to drive the necessary regulatory changes. So I think there's a much needed cooperation between business and governments to drive the needed regulatory reform. I, I look at regulation as necessary. It's like any sport you play, you have to understand the rules, and there ought to be rules relevant to the game that you're playing. Thanks, Jim. Now, to draw this to a close, let me just sketch out two models of the firm. One is the P&L, the balance sheet, shareholder value, quarterly reporting, the C-suite somehow far away from the employees. The other one is what one may call a social organization with lots of stakeholders requiring a lot of communication. Where will the world go over the next years? Is there a clear trend? You can see, I would argue that over the last years, because of the importance which the financial markets have gained, perhaps the balance sheet slash P&L slash shareholder value type of company model became more important. Are we moving away from that, or will we, in two years from now, forget about transparency, responsibility, uh, or do, are we moving towards more looking at a company as a group of people who achieve something together? Who would like to start? Ben. Sharp so, and crispy. Yeah, I will be sharp and crispy. First of all, the word that everybody's looking for is successful. Because people don't make a model, they want to be successful. And the definition of success will help whether you're successful or not. If the definition of success is just the bottom line, you'll get an organization that will deliver just the bottom line. So I think that talking about regulation, and I bring it a little bit wider in context, and would say it's not just regulation, but also legislation, Getting the expectation what to deliver will drive the answer to your question. 
I believe very strongly that we, after the crisis, will enter into a very different world than before the crisis. So when will the economy be restored is the wrong question. You will say, when will the economy, will gr when will the economy grow again? But it will be in a very different context. It will be in a much more global context. I think globalization will be much more on a level playing field. And I think the demands of the market will be much more driven by informed consumers who will not only ask for the better product, but all the way that you make your product green, the way that you use your resources in a transparent way, and the way that you will contribute to society at large. I think that will be a much more informed demanding consumer at the end that will drive a very different business model. Consequence for management? Will this be the CEO in future, a man who leads people or knows how to manage figures? I think the CEO of the future will understand that her or his role, and I start with her or his, will be to manage a diverse group of very uh, informed people to make others the star instead of making themselves the star. A much more enabling role for the CEO. Very good. Who would like to build on that? Morris? Yeah. I, I think that um, the idea that uh, the crisis is a parenthesis uh, would be a wrong idea. We should not forget that uh, millions of people have lost their homes, millions of people have lost their jobs, that millions of people have lost a large share of their wealth that they have lost faith in uh, the market economy, in capitalism, and uh, I believe that there will be what I call a, a reset of the values. And that uh, the companies of tomorrow uh, have to take this into account. And if there is something that I would very much like uh, to take as a lesson for the future for myself and for uh, our company that we should not waste the crisis. We should not waste the opportunity to transform the role of a company into the world. We, we have a role which goes well beyond producing a service of a product and selling it and making a profit. And if we look at this as uh, the goal of a company we will be mistaking because uh, there is uh, a, a feeling of uh, multi-stakeholder approach and uh, the people will not accept anymore that we are making decisions without taking into account the environment in which we live. If you look at what happened in some restructuring in Europe, people are refusing the restructuration they are refusing to leave the company. They are refusing the company is closing doors. They don't accept that because they consider that the company has a responsibility and I share that view. And it's not demagogic to say that, particularly when I'm so far away from my country. I believe that things have changed and we should not waste the crisis. Now, the first thing that we have to rebuild is the faith is the credibility, is the trust of uh, the role of the companies in a market economy which has to be free, which has to be transparent, which has to be open, and which has to be more just, and which has to share decisions as well as wealth in a much better way. If I look now at the role of the CEO, I like the idea I'm not speaking for myself because I'm neither of both, but I like very much the idea that the CEO is no longer a leader, but an inspirer. Somebody who is inspiring the people, who is helping <coughs> everyone to be better than what he is or she is, and that the company and everyone in the company is feeling better and is improving and is doing better. Because the idea that the company is led by one leader, I believe it's an idea of the past. So inspiration is probably 
a far better concept than leader. Thanks very much. Yeah, Mr. Su? Yeah. I will see that in other, uh, other view that the, the company, wh 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 why the company exists. I think the, 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 the corporate exists reason is to create a value. Create a value not only for the customer, not only for shareholder, of course also have to create the value for its employee and in the society, social society. So you have to make all this kind of relevant segment be in the balance. You cannot emphasize the shareholding <coughs> value, maximum of shareholding value, maximum of the, 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 the employee's value. You have to make all this value be balanced. I think that is uh, what we learn from this crisis. So the role of the CEO, I think something like uh, my personal view is like coordinator. You have to understand the demand from your customer. You have to understand the requirement from the uh, uh, government segment, the, the, the regulation, the demand from the employee, and also from the shareholders. So to do that, you have to be communicate, make the company very transparent, and to make the company at the unit to satisfy all the demand from the relevant segment. Thanks very much. Uh, Jim, last word. So uh, as I, I listen to all this and, and try not to uh, repeat it, uh, I think one of the things that has emerged from this crisis is really uh, the setting of a new world economic order. Uh, I think we long saw that some of the developing countries would take a greater presence on the stage of driving the global economies. Uh, I think this gets accelerated uh, in terms of how that takes place, and one just has to look at uh, the impact that China will have, is having, on the economic fundamentals. That manifests itself in the develop because of the role in the developing countries where not just the banks or the corporations have to rebuild their balance sheets, but individuals have to rebuild their balance sheets. And so the consumption that we traditionally saw coming out of developed countries will not be there. So corporations have to go back to creating wealth and value. Uh, and I think that is critically important, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, capitalism, I believe, is not dead. It will manifest itself in a different way. And what gets measured gets done. So we actually have to say, what are the key measurements that we want people to follow so we can get it done? So the leader of a company, and whether you call that leader the CEO or whatever, he has the responsibility to create an environment in which people feel they can live their dreams, they can accomplish their goals and objectives, and he has to foster innovation, inspiration, and implementation to be able to accomplish these things. So the job is perhaps different and a bit more complex, uh, but at the end of the day, I think you still will attract people to these jobs because they're fun and you can make a difference. Thanks very much, uh, Jim, also for bringing this back into a broader context of macroeconomics. Um, what I find interesting uh, when we try to sum this all up, that there is a consensus for management being more responsible, um, more uh, sort of people-oriented, more stakeholder-oriented. And in the back of my mind, that also brings up the issue that, if I look at the panel here, that European influence companies are much closer in that respect to Chinese companies. We have not had a representative of the prototype of an American company here on stage. We may have heard different things. But thanks very much uh, for your contribution. And thanks also, Mr. Soon, that you easily switched from Chinese to English. Thanks very much. Very good. My pleasure.